first of all, thank you. Thank you so very, very much. Thank you. Okay, I, I, as much as I'm an oral cancer survivor, I am now a cancer patient. I'll talk about that later. Oh, I went too far, but anyway, in, in 1963, first day of high school, I started smoking. I quit in June of 2000 when I graduated high school. <laughs> in 2005, I was a quick learner. In 2005, I retired at the age of 55, and that's where that 55 comes from. By the way, you work for five years, you retire at 55. <laughs> so I was very, very happy about that. But in 2007, I started getting headaches. I never had a headache in my entire life. And I drank probably more than anybody in this room over the years. Although I haven't drank for about 13 years. I'm not sure you know. I haven't smoked for about that long. Um, I haven't drank for as long as I've from the time I got treated with cancer, I had to give up the drinking part. Um, so I never had, I had it my entire life. I just went to my GP, I went to ER, this is over a two year period. I went to massage therapists, chiropractors. I went to a natural path. The only thing I didn't go to was a witch doctor because it was not listed on Google, mm -hmm. where I live. 2009, um, I just meant to tell you, I'm an actor. When I retired, I became an actor and a voice artist. And in 2009, after our last performance with Tony and Tina's wedding, which I did every Thursday, and Friday, and Saturday for a year and a half in Vancouver, um, we finished our last show Saturday night, and on Sunday morning, I was in my backyard having a toasted tomato sandwich. And all of a sudden, my mouth started filling with liquid, which was strange because I wasn't drinking anything. I touched my mouth, and there was blood there. What the heck is this? And before I knew it, I couldn't talk because there was this gargling sound like I was choking to death. And I was choking on the blood. My wife called the ambulance. They rushed me to the hospital. And uh, that was on a sa Saturday, sorry, on a Sunday. On Monday, I went and saw the specialist, which the emergency had arranged for me. Um, he put a scope down through my nostril, which, believe me, is not a, more, not a very comfortable feeling. With the camera down to my throat says, Shadow, yeah, you have a tumor and you, the tumor burst. So we're going to schedule you um, for a biopsy as well as a contrast CAT scan. I had the CAT scan on the Wednesday. I had the biopsy that Friday. And on the biopsy, because they were worried about putting the contraption for breathing while they put me out to do the biopsy, they were worried about breaking the tumor again, so I had to be awake, sitting up in the operating room, while four people held me down, and they put the oxygen tube down through my nose, down into my throat, and into my lung. You don't ever want to have that done. So, to make a long story short, in July, uh, after the biopsy, that was on Friday, the doctor said, my secretary will call you on Monday, make an appointment for you to drop in, discuss the results. I said, doc, you got to tell me, is it cancer? He said, I'm pretty sure it is, yeah. On Monday, I phoned his office. He's on holidays for two weeks. And there was no, they weren't checking for messages. And when you got cancer, when you think you got cancer, and even bleeding, you've been in the hospital, your wife bawling her eyes out and thinking you're dying. You're just in shock. You don't know what to do. But I'll tell you what you want to know is you want to know what's going on here. So that period from the first part of June until July, 
I'm towards the end of June when I saw my specialist, and then he told me I would be going to the cancer center in Surrey, and the oncologist would map out a treatment. But he said it would probably be radiation, seven weeks of it, the maximum, as well as chemotherapy. So, I just wanted to show you um, part of the treatment. This is the mask that head and neck cancer patients wear. And it starts out as a, basically a flat piece of material, and then the radiation therapist, because it's wet, it molds to your contours of your face. So while you're having your radiation treatments, you're laying on a table and you're fastened down to the table. Very important not to lose weight while you're going through seven weeks of treatment because you don't want to wiggle around there. And I was always terrified of the radiation hitting my vocal cords or something. You notice that I talk like I sound like I'm drunk. It's because half the right side of my tongue is paralyzed from the radiation. So I keep hitting this button. I'm sorry. So <laughs> there we are. So when I met with the RT oncologist, I knew that I had cancer, but I didn't know how bad. My wife and I sat in Dr. Carvan, his office, in July 2009, and Dr. Carvan told me that I had stage three cancer on the base of my tongue. It was also in my lymph nodes. He said, you have a 20% chance of survival if we give you radiation. If we give you chemo, we can increase that to 40%. My wife started crying and ran out of the room. <clears throat> but I didn't, because somebody needed to be strong for her. And I'd always been there <clears throat> uh, as the, uh, the older, more wise of the two of us. But um, thank thankfully, she was there for me over my treatment period. So, when I was getting fit, fitted for while I was getting fitted for this, the radiation therapist, a very nice lady, said to me, "So how are you today?" And I said, "Well, I just found out I've only got a forty percent chance of surviving." She looked at me. She said, "Well, then you're in the forty percent group, then." <laughs> okay. But I thought about it. What she said was so true because if you wake up in the morning thinking you're in the 60% that's not going to survive, what, what kind of life is that? So I made up my mind, I'm going to be positive. Everybody was telling me to be positive. I'm going to be positive. And if you take nothing out of this room <coughs> from me today, remember my words, remain positive. I was told that many, many times, I'm telling it to you, to tell to any of your family members, friends, patients, anybody who's ever coming up against a serious health situation, be positive. So you'll see the size of the guy on the table there is quite large. I used to go to um, Tits Beach because Wreck Beach, when you're that size, doesn't. <laughs> anyway, I apologize for that picture I just drew, but people would run up and kids' beach and throw pails of water on it. They thought one of the whales was coming in. <laughs> but anyway, um, it probably saved my life, cancer. I, I was a size 52. I just found out rose at break. My waist size was 52. Now it's 34. Um, I put a lot of weight on in my life because of unwise choices, 
The drama had entertained a lot at 10 11 o'clock at night, drinking, eating, what have you. Um, I want to get on to um, the treatments. This, the treatments I had were at Breeze the first two weeks. The chemo, I had the chemo the very first day, and my chemo was not in the chemo room. I went to Surrey Hospital on Sunday, got my chemo treatment on Monday, but I stayed there until Tuesday. Um, it's a pretty heavy dose of chemo, and they wanted to monitor you, I guess. And then they wheeled me down to the radiation. I, kept, I didn't know what radiation was. I didn't know what chemo was. Um, I went to the radiation. They fast me down to the um, table. And the radiation machine went around. I didn't see it here, but it zapped me in seven areas of my neck as it goes all the way around you. And it, each of those entry points, they zapped me twice. So you're there for about 20, 25 minutes. Sometimes longer depending for the setup. But because I was losing so much weight, the danger was that we had to make new masks and postpone my treatments. And I was just, I just didn't want that to happen. I wanted my treatments over as quickly as possible. And what that meant to mention, from the time that I found out I had cancer, early part of June, until my treatment started mid August. I was terrified that it was taking too long. When you only have a 40% chance of surviving, you figure every day counts. Where? Why did they bring me in? But from the first day of my first treatment, I, I, I'm going to tell you, everybody at that cancer center is like family to me. They didn't just treat me. They showed the most incredible amount of respect and a lot of love, not caring, more than caring. They actually love their patients, not just the oncologists, not just the nurses, not just the admin or the RT therapists, everybody who works there. And it's, that whole BC Cancer Agency is filled with people that work tirelessly to get old guys like me and young people um, better. During my treatment, I wasn't able to swallow. I still don't eat solid food. I only have pureed soups, yogurt. Uh, I can't have mashed potatoes, there's lots of gravy. But I haven't had fresh fruit or vegetables, raw vegetables or meat in six years, over six years, since August of 2009. I've had probably a couple of container loads full of onshore over the years. But I'm here. I'm here. The pain was like no pain I could ever describe. I had a fentanyl patch on my shoulder. I was drinking so I couldn't swallow so the liquid morphine. I would tilt my head back and just let it pour down my throat. I didn't use a measuring cup. When you've got bleeding blisters off through here, all the hair from the radiation from the radiation from my nose down to here, stop no, I lost all the hair. My wife had never seen me in 37 years without a mustache. My dog bit me. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> my wife bit me, the dog bit me. No. <laughs> but um, it was, the, the one thing I want to ask you, the people at the BC Cancer Agency, I believe it was in Surrey, the uh, people in the pharmacy there developed a, a thing for pain for people like myself, and it's called the Fraser Valley Mouthwash. And it is, it, it was one thing that kept me, uh, it was all the pain. It was even more effective than the morphine. And the morphine, I've never taken morphine or drugs in my, my life. I never felt high from it. I guess that tells you what kind of pain was involved. But I survived. There's a feeding tube. Never ate. 
and it, but unsure, and even the feeding tube was always getting infected, it was getting plugged up, and when I couldn't get medication to be to the tube, because it would always plug up on the weekends when there was nobody to help me. I kind of look like in there, don't I? This is the window. The last week of that seven week treatment, I was so sick, I was begging my wife not to take me to the cancer center. When I got there, <clears throat> um, they, put, <clears throat> they put me in the, in the hospital and my body was starting to shut down because it was starving. I had no fluids in me because I couldn't swallow them. I, I couldn't get fluids in me anyway. They booked me in the hospital on 51 North, the oncology floor. And I, that night was the first night I thought, I, I don't think I'm going to, I don't think I'm going to get out of here. That's the window from 51 North. I figured that's what I get to look at before I head off to the astral plane. But that was 2009, November 2009. Within two weeks of my treatment, two weeks after treatment is the worst part of the treatment. That's what your pain is at, it's the absolute worst. Um, from 2010 to present, I've lost 13 teeth. In fact, from one checkup in June till six months later, I had 12 cavities despite using fluoride treatments and what have you. I'm not saying that the radiation does that to everybody, but certainly to me. I had great teeth and I lost my teeth. I, I've had implants. That picture to the left was um, my face three days after the first implants I had done. I had three teeth on the right side, three teeth on the left side, and a bridge in between them. I have a partial bomb with five teeth. So when I was acting during my treatment, or after my treatments for hockey players or toothless pirates, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> the dentistry at the cancer center last year, my 65th birthday, um, they gave me this little thing. And I, I, I'm just so happy to be there. Dr. Chan and Kathy and Donna, and I've been volunteering at the Cancer Center for five years. I'm, I'm trying to give a little bit back. And every year I do the Santa Claus. And uh, it goes over well with not just the patients, but with the staff. So I'm chasing my dreams again, although I guess the most I'll ever become is an almost famous actor, <laughs> as an almost pregnant. Think about it. <laughs> it's my last attempt at humor. <laughs> you know, we get it around 3 o'clock the afternoon, so I'm very, very witty. <laughs> and um, I, I write about my cancer, about volunteering, about my weird and wonderful life. Um, I don't write about politics or religion. I have a website there. I, I'd like to make an offer to each and every one of you, if you ever want me to come and talk to one or two people, if you know somebody who has cancer who needs to talk to somebody, um, I, I, I'm retired, I have nothing but time, so, so thank you once again for what you've done for me. You're going to be saving more lives than you can ever imagine. You may not have thought that when you decided to go into the field of dentistry, either as a dentist or a clinician, but you are going to make a lot of difference. And thank you for all the cancer patients. And one last thing. Families are very, very important when you're going through cancer. When I was going through mine, my mother in Toronto was in a hospital. And I didn't dare tell her that I had cancer. But I gotta tell you, even at 59 years old, I wish my mom could have helped me and given me a hug and said, you're gonna be okay. I couldn't.
couldn't be. I phoned her. I used to phone her three, four times a week. I used to go to Toronto five, six times a year. And suddenly, from November, from August 2009 to the summer 2010, I, I just couldn't go anywhere. I was so pretty sick. But I decided that my mom wasn't getting any better. So I phoned her on a Friday night in September, September the 10th. 2010, and I said, Mom, I'm coming down. I just put my flight. I'll be there in two, two weeks. And my, my mom said, that'd be nice. I went to bed so excited, not knowing what I was going to do when I take her for dinner because I can't eat. And the phone rang at 6 and 5. It was my sister. I mean, my mom just died. So, I'm not saying that out of any desire to have your sympathy, but there is a huge price patients with cancer pay. And sometimes you just never stop paying. But thank you for being patient. Sorry for going over, doctor. I'm just carried away here, but it's been a very, very special thing. I've been so excited for months knowing I would be able to come here and give you my story, and I apologize for going on for so long. I will be here during lunch hour. If anybody wants to come and talk to me or ask me questions, if you don't, that's fine too, but I'd be more than pleased to talk to any of you, and my phone number's there. Thank you.